Hello, and welcome back to War Economy and State. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Zachary Yost. And this is the monthly foreign policy podcast of the Mises Institute, where we just check in and see what regimes around the world are trying to do in terms of starting World War III these days. And, uh, and that always includes, of course, the United States regime, which is an active player in uh, playing up global conflict. But we're, we're open to criticizing all regimes equally, and uh, so we like, we like to give them a close look. And, and this week, we're looking at uh, the antics from both the U.S. government and the Chinese government uh, in terms of balloon hysteria. And uh, it has certainly been a big issue uh, since uh, a Chinese balloon of some kind flew over the northern continental United States, and then there were there was basically a freakout in the media, less so from the Pentagon. Um, the Pentagon's a little more uh, restrained when it comes to actual foreign powers who could put up a fight, I've noticed. Yeah, sure, the Pentagon's always in favor of invading some... A uh, country that can't defend itself, but when it comes to another country with nuclear arms and stuff, often the uh, the Pentagon is a bit more reasonable, and they seem to be somewhat reasonable in this case. But the hysteria in the media and among polit- or especially Republican politicians in Congress, was just quite over the top. And so, if you weren't following the story, there was this big balloon. And it was over the U.S., and then it didn't get shot down till it exited uh, U.S. land space um, over the Atlantic Ocean down, I believe, off South Carolina, and then it was shot down. And we are supposed to believe that this presented a grave and novel new threat to the American people somehow. Uh, never mind the fact, of course, that uh, China has many, many low-orbit spy satellites that are functioning as we speak. And of course, the United States does the same thing. So talk about a tiny blip in the whole record of large countries spying on each other because they can and because they do and have been doing so for many decades. Uh, But I guess for some reason, this big balloon, because people saw a photo of it online, got people really, really worked up about it. And We're trying to uh, kind of point out the absurdity of this, but also just how insane it is to uh, just try continually trying to stir up conflict with with the Chinese regime unnecessarily, which, by the way, should never be confused with pacifism or this idea that armed neutrality has no benefits— But the fact of the matter is, is that starting a major conflict with a major nuclear power over something so minor and which provides no reason to suspect that any sort of new or real threat is offered by it really is just a great illustration of just how hysterical Washington is. And I think how much they recognize that maybe they can benefit from whipping up the voters in terms of anti-Chinese sentiment. Uh, but maybe you have a different take on it, uh, Zach. I mean, when you when you watch the Chinese thing unfold, the balloon, balloon gate, uh, <laughs> what was your reaction? I definitely wanted the government to shoot it down. And I think a lot of people did just because we all have a toddler inside of us who likes to, you know, pop the bubble wrap and it's just a giant bubble wrap up there. But um yeah, I mean, it to me, it made sense to shoot it down. It was violating our sovereignty and all that sort of stuff. But it wasn't that big a deal, as you've mentioned. I mean, there's so much spying going on. This was just a highly visible incident of it. Um, and I think it might be how Americans have such a highly moralized view of foreign policy, uh, where it's, it's sort of like a romantic play or something that... Uh, it's just outrageous to them that this this is happening. Um, whereas if you have a more realistic <laughs> conception of how, you know, the, the tragedy of great power politics, as it were, you'd understand, well, this is just something that happens and we don't need to go code red. I mean, one of my friends told me that he got into a fight with someone at his church because this person thought that in response, the U.S. should sink China's aircraft carrier. 
which, by the way, is ancient. It, it's literally a Soviet Union, like, uh, <laughs> fire sale, like, junk that they actually bought from Ukraine, okay? <laughs> yeah, if you're picturing a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier, <laughs> you are picturing, picturing something very, very unlike the Chinese aircraft carrier. Yeah, um, people were going nuts over this. There, there's a spying going on all the time. I mean, D.C.'s undoubtedly infested with spies, including from our so-called allies and friends. But sure, it's violating uh, U.S. sovereignty, so we should shoot it down. I mean, like, people were complaining that they missed... Uh, uh, now they're shooting down, you know, anything that moves, apparently, above <laughs> a certain altitude. And uh, over Lake Huron, apparently they missed with the first Sidewinder missile, and people were complaining Oh, it had, each missile cost four hundred thousand dollars, which is you know a lot of money. But it uh, this all this money shooting down who knows what is the best money the Defense Department spent in decades. <laughs> it's actually been spent in defense of our you know sovereignty of actual America. It's something that occurred within ten thousand miles of right, the United exactly. States. Yes. Uh, remarkable. <laughs> and now comes the UFO talk, right? I mean. <laughs> Who knows all that stuff that's up there? And this is actually a tactic China has used off and on is, you know, you just fly a bunch of stuff around and see what happens. And actually, if the balloon exercise was an attempt to see how the U.S. public would react uh, to Chinese devices in U.S. airspace, they collected a lot of interesting data there, I would say. I mean, who knows? They, maybe they just did to see, let's just see what happens. That's an intelligence gathering mission, essentially. Yeah, I mean, think of how much, how many man hours were dedicated to <laughs> these balloons and whatnot. I mean, it, it took up a lot of finite space and resources of people scrambling around. And I mean, uh, also the balloons, I mean, it sort of speaks to how secure America is in that our enemies, uh, the traditional ways our enemies attack us is with high altitude balloons. <laughs> because in... Um, in World War II, I think, like, the only attacks on the continental U.S. Um, were Japan floated these balloons way up into the stratosphere with bombs that just randomly fell, like, in the Washington forest or something. Like, so, uh, you know, it's, it's not that big a deal. I thought it was sort of fun. Uh, just, you know, oh, boy, this thing everyone can see, but it's not... Spying's not the end of the world. Everyone does it. And I think the fact that so many people don't get that speaks to how we just have a poor understanding of the international system. Well, and of course, if when you hear about something, a alleged spy device being shot down at high altitude, if you follow international relations, of course, you immediately think of the 1960 U-2 incident where the Soviets shot down an American plane uh, over the Soviet Union, which had a pilot in it who parachuted down and then was captured. He was sentenced to for espionage and put in prison, where he served two years before a a, um, a trade with some uh, Soviet spy in an American prison, and uh, that was that was a whole big deal. Naturally, it wasn't surprising at all to hear that Eisenhower didn't think it was a great idea to fly these planes with pilots in them over the Soviet Union, and he was he was correct. Uh, but you know, funnily, the uh, the United States uh, first uh, claimed this was a weather information gathering mission, uh, which the Soviets didn't buy. Uh, and then there was a whole cover up, and uh, of course, they were telling the public one thing and. You know, just the exact sort of antics that you would expect from any sort of nation state in this position. And I just always think it's so funny that uh, with when China behaves exactly like the United States either is currently behaving or has behaved, that uh, this is some sort of a dastardly deed uh, unrivaled un, uh, in the history of international state relations. But I guess it comes back to what you say about this moralistic view toward everything. Right. And I guess it kind of makes you miss the British a little bit, at least the British during all their colonial antics and international meddling. They all did understand this is this is the game. Right. This is what we do to, uh, you know, uh, deal with our rivals like France and Russia and Turkey and 
so on. And there was a certain detach, a moral detachment from it, to be sure. But uh, yeah, Americans, uh, everything's moral. And so it, uh, and every war is, it has to be like some moral crusade. And so that just, I guess, informs every foreign policy decision that uh, takes place within our borders. But it, you raised another uh, issue on this was uh, an interesting legal issue that uh, is fun to think about and maybe someday will be relevant, is what if a state National Guard unit, state Air National Guard unit, had scrambled planes and shot down the Chinese balloon itself, saying, hey, we just had this, we had this incursion in our airspace and we don't know what it was, so we shot it down. That's what the Air National Guard is for. It was a defensive measure. How do you think the Pentagon would respond to that? What, how would that change the nature of uh, the debate? Yeah, this was uh, an interesting question I just thought of uh, watching the balloon float along when everyone was like, why isn't the government shut, shooting it down, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm definitely not a lawyer, but in my Google law degree, uh, the Constitution says that a state cannot, quote, engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. So I think it, uh, part of the question hinges on whether or not an airspace violation is, would count as an invasion. But I also, uh, talking with some friends, discovered another loophole where if the airspace violation did not count as an invasion, then it doesn't fall under the federal government's purview. Could a state shoot down the spy balloon claiming that it was violating like wiretapping laws or something? And it's like, this is not a military operation. <laughs> you know, we are just enforcing our, our own uh, laws. Whereas if it was I think it could be a fun court case. You know, if it was actually like this was an invasion, we have the right to shoot it down then. Um, I mean, who? I doubt the Supreme Court would be super amenable to these sort of states' rights, state sovereignty arguments, but <laughs> it would be fun nonetheless. Yeah, I think it's well established that the Constitution doesn't actually care what the text of the Constitution, or that the Supreme Court doesn't care what the Constitution text actually says. Uh, and what was clear to everyone in the 19th century apparently is uh, like reading Sanskrit today for federal lawyers. Uh, so you're right, of course, that's a great loophole, right? If the federal government says, oh, it's a, it's a violation of U.S. sovereignty, so we had to shoot it down, that would create, it would seem, the precedent, not the legal precedent in the technical sense, but certainly a political and tactical precedent that, oh, well, a foreign balloon in your airspace is an invasion. And if it is an invasion, then the state National Guard has the prerogative to deal with it. So I would love to see how that would be de <laughs> dealt with in court. I think it would only become an issue in the future as the federal government starts to weaken in power due to massive debt and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, right now, I think there's, uh, I don't think it's likely, the Pentagon would absolutely freak out, I think, if uh, the, the State National Guard informed them that we've sent up some planes to shoot this Chinese device and we'll just see what happens. Yes. Also, though, it, it could, there would be, a, a, I mean, it'd be good states asserting, you know, their rights, decentralization, but there would be the trade-off of then we'd get all these governors would be posing with like these giant Cold War era <laughs> uh, flat guns that can shoot up to 40,000 feet. They'd be running commercials like, we will defend, you know, North Dakota from the Chinese threat. It'd sort of be like Michael Dukakis driving around in the tank, except people would be like, oh, yes, <laughs> we must defend the cornfields of Iowa from the Chinese spying. Except the flip side of that is, though, that's not as dangerous because none of these National Guards have the capability of launching international wars or taking... That is true. That's true, yes. <laughs> so they're very limited in their capability. Yes. <laughs> so it's kind of like the Lithuanian Air Force uh, having a parade or something like that, right? It takes 10 no, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Although, actually, yes. I would probably say that your medium-sized U.S. state probably has a bigger air force than most Baltic states. But nevertheless, yeah, 
they don't have really aggressive military capability. Defensive is sufficient, in my view. Uh, but uh, you're right. That would be quite a sight to behold, though. Um, but I would think the federal government would view that as a big challenge to their power, uh, claiming, oh, look, these, these state governments now think that they have some sort of role to play in the military defense of the U.S., which, of course, was the original intent of the text of the U.S. Constitution. Um, but uh, since we nationalized the National Guard in 1903, I believe, with the Knox Act, we don't believe that anymore, I guess. Um, but you're right. I think it would revive that. Even the, I mean, like the Pennsylvania Constitution, which has been uh, revised since uh, in the last century, uh, the, the PA governor is like identified as the commander in chief of the Pennsylvania Armed Forces. And I think it's like that in lots of other places, too. So it's like, I mean, it, the, it's sort of like the legal structure is there for um, some semblance of a case to be made. And then also on a sort of funny side note, uh, when I was reading about all this, I discovered that it's actually been upheld by the Supreme Court that states can have treason clauses, <laughs> uh, treason, uh, that it's um, basically, it's, understood under legal doctrine that a citizen in the U.S. has two loyalties, one to the state in which they're a citizen of and to the federal government, and in the Constitution, but also under regular, you know, they've recognized this in practice, the state can, you know, prosecute someone for treason against the state. And I was very surprised to learn that that's actually how John Brown was executed. <laughs> I did not know that. But um, no one's been executed for treason against the U.S., apparently, but uh, against the state of Virginia, <laughs> they have been. So that was amusing. Yeah, I did an article for that on Mises.org looking at uh, the history of uh... Uh, basically insurrection and all it was in relation to January 6th and it looked at uh, the existing laws that we have in terms of treason and treason like crimes and how this is all really a uh, post civil war purely post civil war uh, invention of any sort of insurrection or treason charge beyond just what was listed in in the constitution very strictly as actually taking up arms against the United States and part of that was going back to the English Civil War, like most of the Bill of Rights and all the good parts of the Constitution, because the Stuart Kings were always broadly defining treason to, well, this guy did something I don't like, so he has committed treason, and there was no clear limit on what that meant. So they very closely defined it in the U.S. Constitution. So, yeah, part of the reason so few people have been actually prosecuted under that is that historically the law allowed for very little. But they created then all of these sort of insurrection-related laws, not quite at the level of treason, and then you can be nailed for those things. Um, but the initial idea was that all of the only places that people could have been prosecuted for uh, treason or were most likely to be prosecuted for taking up arms against the state somehow um, was actually at the state level. And, yeah, Shays' Rebellion. In right, exactly. All that sort of stuff and all those little things that happened throughout the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, this was all state-centered stuff. Um, but back to the Chinese balloon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the uh, uh, one thing that I thought of immediately... Uh, when I saw the whole freak out over the balloon was, here we go again. Now, uh, this was because I remembered back in 2001, uh, and I sent you a funny email about it. I said, <laughs> I said, hey, you remember this? And you said, I, well, I think I was in uh, grade school at the time, yes. so I don't really remember. Uh, but I was about 24, um, when the Hainan Island incident occurred. And so if you're middle-aged like me, you may remember then that uh, back on in April of 2001, so this is pre-9-11, uh, a U.S. spy plane was 70 miles off the coast of uh, China, specifically Hainan Island, which is very much part of China. And uh, so it was intercepted by two Chinese planes, and they, uh, uh, they one of them collided with the U.S. spy plane, uh, disappeared, pilot presumed dead afterward. Uh, the U.S. plane, however, was uh, capable of landing uh, on Hainan Island 
where the pilots were captured and detained. And then, of course, uh, the Bush administration uh, had to negotiate with them to get these pilots back and all of that. And there was, they, they for the most part, de-escalated the situation and were fairly reasonable about it. Uh, but remember, this is all pre-9-11, too. Uh, when at the time the U.S. actually, when Bush had run on and won on a humble foreign policy position, and hard to imagine that Bush had tried to express that his foreign policy would be about uh, limited, l- limited meddling uh, around the world, uh, but uh, that certainly changed with historical events after 9/11. Uh, but then there was, yeah, so there was a whole dust up with that, but. There was a, a very much, while the, the, the federal government uh, responded with s- some amount of reasonableness, it, you had a, a response in the media and in Congress very similar to what you have now, where you had lots of members of Congress just absolutely going bonkers over there. How dare, how dare the Chinese intercept our plane that was flying right off their coast? And our spy plane, by the way. And and then, of course, the media, you know, Rush Limbaugh, those sorts of people just went absolutely bonkers um, because you had all these unreformed Cold War type conservatives who already in 2001 wanted a new Cold War with the Chinese back then, um, which I guess was uh, just uh, to keep China from being less poor. I mean, that's mostly what China was focused on back then. And and of course, boy, how many uh, trillions of dollars of uh, goods and services? I know we act like we don't export anything around the world, but the fact of the matter is the Chinese not only buy a lot of U.S. services, but also invest a lot of uh, the money we give them back into U.S. capital. Uh, and of course, buy U.S. debt, which enables the federal government to spend even more on all you people on Social Security, Medicare, welfare, etc., uh, so that's all that's all due to uh, reinvestment of uh, dollars spent in China back into the United States. Nevertheless, uh, for for 20 years, we've been hearing about it, the need for a new Cold War in China. And so the it just was basically a, re, a repeat, basically, rhetorically nowadays with the. Uh, the Chinese balloon, and uh, and then the Hainan Chinese incident. The the role, I guess, was reversed, of course, is that it was the U.S. that was uh, spying very, very close to China. And, of course, the U.S. has all its satellites going over China as well. But it was the same sort of moralistic uh, posturing back then was, oh, my goodness, uh, an attack on a U.S. plane is like an attack on Omaha, Nebraska, and we have to do something about it. And these Chinese aren't going to stop until they destroy all of our airplanes. And uh, that was that was the tone back then. And of course, not surprisingly, Lou Rockwell had to write articles saying, hey, maybe World War III with China is a bad idea. And uh, you should think twice about it. Uh, you write wingers out there. Um, then, of course, we forgot about China because of 9-11 for a long time, but now it's back. And so I guess we should just expect more and more of this as time goes on, right, where just every little thing with the Chinese is going to be just one more call uh, for escalation with the Chinese. Uh, how much of that is true in reality and how much of it translates into actual behind-the-scenes conversations between the U.S. regime and the Chinese regime. That's something people have to keep in mind, is that politicians will play up their belligerence toward foreign regimes a lot for public consumption, because they know the public likes to go bonkers about hating on foreigners. But then what's out of sight is these politicians saying, hey, you know, I, I have to pretend I hate you for the hayseeds back home, but you and I, of course, know that we'll get along just fine as these as two regimes that have to coexist in the world. That doesn't mean, of course, the U.S. is going to retreat from uh, its positions in East Asia. But I think you probably would expect that behind closed doors, the U.S. is going to continue to tell the Chinese regime that, like, look, um, you know, we know you spy on us. We're going to continue to spy on you, but we had to shoot it down uh, for the case of the public and then make a big deal out of it. Uh, but we'll just go from here. And that's probably closer to the reality. But I think that the more the public presses on this issue, the more it could really produce, I think, um, an actual overreaction that could cause real problems at some point in the future. 
Yeah, um, yeah. I, I thought it was bad that the U.S. canceled a high-level diplomatic talk with China um, because of the balloon incident. Um, whereas I think you know, if if the public was sufficiently Machiavellian in the good sense, <laughs> uh, they would uh, just see that this is what happens. And I think that it it might be helpful to talk about like why all this spying happens, and it's not just between supposed foes. <laughs> Uh, you know, China and the U.S., but I mean, I think one of the only actual treason convictions <laughs> in U.S. history was against um, uh, Jonathan Pollard, who worked for one of the intel agencies, who was convicted of spying for Israel. Um, you know, quite a different reaction <laughs> uh, um, to uh, to that back then versus now with China. But it's like, wow, Israel, they're our friend. Why would they spy on us? And it's like, it's guaranteed all of our NATO allies have spies in D.C. and whatnot. And it's, it's because of the radically uncertain nature of the future, which is sort of a core, you know, realist, uh, a fundamental <laughs> assumption about the world. We don't know what the future holds. And there's a very good quote from Charles de Gaulle, which is... Um, States do not have, uh, states have no permanent friends, only permanent interests, you know. So who's your friend today might not be your friend tomorrow. Um, I mean, there's very, uh, if any of the viewers have ever watched um, Yes, Prime Minister, it's hilarious 80s British sitcom, the prime minister, I can't remember exactly the context, but the <laughs> the guy is explaining to him, you know, we must be prepared to face our true enemies. And he's like, the Soviets? And he goes, no, the French, of course. <laughs> you know, it's like the Soviets are just an interlude in our, you know, thousand-year-long feud with the French. And it's like uh, everyone spies on everyone because we need to know information. We don't know what other people are thinking. And it, it's why the world is risky, why there is the tragedy of great power politics, is even if a state is building up militarily purely for defensive reasons, there's no way that any other power can know that for sure. And so they feel threatened, and then they build up, and you know, and hence, you know, the unhappy fallen world we live in. Um, but so it's just spying happens. Sure, we should not like be, oh, <laughs> there goes, you know, the Chinese spy plane or something. But, you know, we should just recognize this is as normal as, you know, you know, people stealing from the grocery store. It's, it's not good, but it's just a fact of life that happens and grocery stores have learned to deal with it and we just need to, you know, it happens. We don't need to, you know, you know, set up a guillotine to execute shoplifters just because it's a fact <laughs> of life. Shoot to kill everyone who breaks the law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yes, this is, of course, a very important point is the uncertainty. Right. And you can see this uh, in how uncertainty often leads to unnecessary conflicts. It's it's not just that uncertainty makes people afraid and so they're unwilling to enter into conflict um, that maybe could be an issue but very often other states are often overly confident about their abilities or about the defense of other states this has been historically an issue so this is in many cases states have started wars with an unrealistic view of their relative power and capability relative to other states, because they just didn't know the size of the economy of the other state. Um, they didn't understand maybe uh, just how much another state was willing to put up a fight for a long period of time and all of those sorts of issues. And if you think think if you miscalculate and think those things are low that look they're going to give up immediately and then you start a war and it turns out they weren't willing to give up immediately or that they had economic and military capabilities that you weren't aware of now you've started a completely unnecessary war that you had no chance of winning and so 
you can see why why everybody's going to want to spy then in those cases. There might be an off chance that, oh, you only need to build up your military power so much in order to be on a par or have true defensive capability against state X. And how do we know this? Well, we need to send in some spies to maybe get a better idea of what the other state's capability is. Or if you're an aggressive state, you want to send in spies and say, hey, can we get it, get away with attacking this state. But then you send in your spies and the spies are like, oh yeah, well, these countries, they got like huge military and economic capability. We better not try. Uh, we better not start a war with them. Well, that's that's all to the good then, if <laughs> that sort of information flows in a way that it prevents conflict. And uh, one way that actually worked, uh, and one of the many in instances where the CIA was just so pathetically wrong, uh, was when they continually um, reported that the Soviet economy was a powerhouse uh, yeah. and was just amazing. And uh, you can look at some of the uh, the ridiculous ways that the, the Soviets try or that the CIA tried to measure the Soviet economy. It was uh, they just looked at the amount of dresses in department stores and things like that. Um, and some some critiques by economists have come out on this, noting that the CIA had no concept of like different heterogeneous nature of quality in goods and services. So they just counted the number of items available in different item classes and didn't look at the equality uh, and recognizing that everything that the Soviets had was just a crappier version of what the Americans had, right? Because their economy was garbage. And so there was this huge overemphasis on what uh, the Soviet economy was like. Now, on one level, that uh, prevented the U.S. from being more belligerent than it was toward the Soviets. On the other side, there was a downside because it continually fed American hysteria about a missile gap and our inability to deal with an aggressive Soviet Union. So uh, it's hard to predict how a lack of information will play out. But, yeah, not only does everybody want spies for that reason, but how do you know your spies are actually even collecting reliable information? And so it's just it's just with anything, right? Industrial espionage. You, you don't know what's going on with your competitors and you're just trying to get some info and you never know if it's good. So it's not going to end. Not going to end anytime soon. And also doesn't really provide a big threat either in terms of with the United States so far ahead of everybody else in terms of military capability. Other countries knowing to what extent the U.S. is far ahead of them provides no threat to the U.S. All it does is reiterate the fact that the U.S. has thousands of nukes uh, and it has a nuclear triad and it has uh, immense defensive military capability. You may find out that the U.S.'s ability to maybe wage war in Eastern Europe is not that great. Uh, but in terms of defending North America, I think all they're going to find out is that, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> trying to send a flotilla across the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of North America probably is not a winning strategy. Right, yeah, another a re another sort of recent example that everyone's forgotten about now, uh, <laughs> despite the hysteria at the time, was the hypersonic missile, where China, uh, you know, launched an intercontinental missile that, you know, that traversed the entire globe at hypersonic speeds, and people were freaking out and everything. But in reality, you know, uh, it's not... it. Our inability, it, it, it just sort of like speaks to misunderstandings about missile defense and things like that. It's like, does it matter if we can shoot that missile down or not? Because we have a survivable second stripe capability, you know, and everyone was like, this is such an intelligence failure, <laughs> you know, you know, the hypersonic missile gap and, and all this stuff. And it's like, it doesn't matter if China builds another thousand nuclear missiles or something. They only have roughly 300 now. It's just like, we could, you know, rain death and destruction upon anyone who, you know, used a nuclear missile. And if that deterrent does not work, well, <laughs> you know, it, it's not not much good. And it sort of like gets to like we've spent gajillions and I mean so much money on missile defense over decades that's almost entirely theoretical. And I mean, you can make the argument that missile defense actually is destabilizing because if one country thinks 
oh, uh, we can't uh, issue a second strike. We have no deterrent against the U.S. or whatever. Then it leads to this sort of innovation. Like, oh, we need a hypersonic missile and things like that. So I think it's sort of, I think missile defense is also another issue that's driven by public, you know, outcry of do something, do something itis, you know, and it's just sort of uh, spying, you know, the ability to nuke the United States. These are just facts of life that we have to live with. And, you know, uh, we can be calm and collected and things will be fine, most likely. <laughs> most likely, right. And uh, back to that point of how many nukes you got. I mean, you may disagree, but I don't think I happen to agree with the school of thought that you just don't need that many for deterrence. So if the U.S. has 5,000 nuclear uh, warheads ready to go, that's probably about 4,900 more than it actually needs to provide uh, deterrence. And uh, so, yeah, the, the uh, some hypersonic missiles, when you have a nuclear triad moving around, where two-thirds of that is moving around all the time, I mean, it's just, it just means nothing. But it, it's a similar thing, then, to the spy thing. I, but if you're not paying attention to international relations ever until something is on the front page of the online newspaper, uh, then it seems like this is some new amazing threat. And then people freak out because they're just not otherwise paying attention. So they don't know about all that white noise that's going on in the background constantly. So this seems like something new and threatening. And they and it's amazing, too, at, at the threats they will ascribe to the Chinese regime when you consider the size of the American regime and its ability to violate rights of Americans. So Americans are spied on every minute by their government, uh, are open to all sorts of federal prosecutions at any given time. We've seen what happens at, at places like Waco and all of that. Uh, but, oh, the real problem is the Chinese regime, because they might take a picture of your backyard. So much worse than what uh, the FBI might do with uh, its latest uh, FISA abuse against your Fourth Amendment rights. So it's uh, quite remarkable what people are, are prioritizing there. And I guess that's one of the biggest downsides of nationalism. And I think that nationalism as a threat is way overblown. But one of the real problems with it is that it does tend uh, to have people just ignore what their own regime is doing against them and focus laser-like on what foreign regimes are doing out there. And then encourage greater power be handed over to, uh, quote-unquote, our regime, what they view as somehow an organization that that is their friend uh, in the name of fighting some foreign regime, which may not wish them well either, but has nowhere near the capability of actually violating their rights the way the domestic regime does in most cases. And so that seems to be just a dynamic here as well, with the, the threat of Chinese spying being held up as far, far worse than whatever it is the U.S. regime is doing. Uh, against the Bill of Rights at any given time. So that's just a dynamic we're stuck with for now as well. Yeah, it's sort of the, like the, the, the part of sometimes people argue in favor of sanctions on like Iran and stuff is that if we squeeze the country, the people will stop supporting the regime. It's also the same logic behind at least part of uh, the argument for strategic bombing campaigns <laughs> uh, is, you know, oh, we'll just, they level the city and the people will rise up against their government and historically, you know, it like never happens. The people rally around the government. <laughs> um, and, and, and on the spying thing, uh, I can't remember when it happened. Now it was like eight years ago maybe or something, but there was a hack into the federal government like personnel database. I think it might have been by China or something, but it's like <laughs> the government got all this information on like all these people who work for the federal government because it was the federal government's information <laughs> on the people. <laughs> you know, it's it sort of, uh, you know, ironic in a sense. Now I think we pay for, uh, you know, uh, LifeLock or whatever it's called for like thousands of former federal government employees. But <laughs> the, uh, the whole thing's ironic, I think, is uh, is part of the fun of uh, keeping track of these sorts of things. And we do our best to try and prevent uh, 
things from getting out of hand. But uh, that's a problem we just have constantly with our readership because uh, we do have a significant overlap with the conservative audiences and especially some of the more old school conservatives have still not kind of come around to, as you and I have with the restraint school, with the realism, they're still heavily, even among conservatives, just all these notions of international liberalism and humanitarian interventions and that the U.S. is the shining city on the hill and all of that stuff. That old stuff dies hard. And from what I'm seeing, it's uh, at least among uh, the the older age cohorts hasn't gone anywhere, given the amount of criticism we get anytime we run an article at Mises.org uh, promoting peace uh, instead of constant escalation. But uh, with that, we better ma- uh, wrap up this episode here of War, Economy, and State. Thank you, Zachary, for joining me again this month. We'll be back next month with a new episode, depending on whatever's going on then. And so we'll see you next time.